A guide to growing Brussels sprouts. A vegetable with big flavor and nutritional value, Brussels sprouts are loaded with fiber and important vitamins. Native to the Mediterranean area, they come from the cabbage family. And though they can be eaten raw, they taste less bitter and much better when cooked. Brussels sprouts varieties. Long Island Improved, an heirloom variety that grows self-supporting, voluminous stalks. These plants are shorter than other varieties at only 24 inches tall. They take about 90 days to mature. Dagon, this variety is known for its early maturing plants. It's tall, dense, and produces medium to large Brussels sprouts. Plants take about 100 days to mature. Churchill, a flavorful variety that's easily grown in a variety of climates. It is also known to be ready for market early in the season. Plants mature in about 90 days. Diablo. These plants are tall, heavy, and produce medium-sized sprouts that are ready for harvest in the late fall and early winter. Plants take about 110 days to mature. Red Brussels sprouts. Varieties like Red Darling produce purple-red sprouts and stems and are typically sweeter than most green varieties. Plants are slow to mature, needing about 140 days to reach maturity. Brussels sprouts are more successful when transplanted as opposed to directly seeded. The ideal soil temperature for direct sowing Brussels sprouts is between 50 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 to 29 degrees Celsius. While they can germinate in soil temperatures as low as 40 degrees Fahrenheit, there won't be the same success rate as there would be with soil temperatures that are between 50 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. When it comes to the air, Brussels sprouts temperature tolerance is between 26 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, negative two to 24 degrees Celsius. Prolonged air temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit will promote flowering, which is something to try and avoid. Brussels sprouts prefer well-drained, fertile soil with good water retention. The soil's pH should also be between 6.0 and 7.5 for Brussels sprouts to thrive. Organic matter, like well-rotted manure or compost, can be added to the soil at the end of the season in the fall or at the beginning of the season in the spring. About five to seven weeks after starting seeds indoors, those seedlings can be transplanted. When using pots or trays, three seeds can be sown per pot or cell about a quarter of an inch deep. It's also best to use starting soil to give seedlings a good foundation. Grow Brussels sprouts in full sun. They need about six hours of direct sunlight each day. Watering. Brussels sprouts need consistent moisture to properly produce their tight, flavorful sprouts with a nice texture. If there isn't at least one inch of rain each week, give plants a minimum of one good watering per week, making sure to soak the soil. Avoid overhead watering and water any young transplants either every day or after the top two inches of soil has dried. If grown in sandy soils, Brussels sprouts will need to be watered more than once a week. Staking. Brussels sprouts plants grow to about 30 inches tall and can become quite heavy when their sprouts start to form. Because of this, it's important to monitor the plants. If they start to bend or collapse, Stake them using wooden, bamboo, or metal stakes, and tie them up gently using soft cloth to avoid causing any damage. Fertilizer. Note, the following are general fertilizer practices to use, but fertilizer might need to be adjusted based on the soil's specific needs. Avoid applying any fertilizer to the crop that contains weed suppressors. After transplanting, Dissolve one tablespoon of a 20-20-20, 20% nitrogen, 20% phosphorus, 20% potassium fertilizer in one gallon of water. Apply eight ounces to each plant after they've been transplanted. 
Brussels sprout plants should be fertilized again about two weeks after planting by side dressing with composted manure or an all-purpose granular NPK fertilizer that has an equal ratio. To side dress, simply apply the fertilizer around each individual plant, about six to eight inches from the stem. Mix the granules into the top layer of soil, being careful not to damage the roots of the plant. Then water around the plant to activate the fertilizer. Mulch. Apply a thin layer of mulch, only one to two inches, to suppress weeds and improve water retention. Organic materials like straw, hay, or grass clippings can all be used as mulch. Transplanting Best Practices Brussels sprouts can be transplanted outside about five to seven weeks after they've been sown indoors. But first, the plants will need to be hardened off. Get seedlings adjusted to outdoor conditions to minimize their stress. Set the pots or trays of seedlings outside at least a week before transplanting, leaving them in a sheltered spot where they'll be protected from wind and direct sun. If there's any threat of overnight frost, the plants should be brought inside, then taken back out in the morning. Seedlings should be slowly introduced to direct sun, giving them more time in the sun each day until it's time to transplant. Once the seedlings are ready, after the last frost, Find a spot with well-draining, rich soil that has good water retention and gets full sun. Plants should be spaced about 18 to 24 inches apart in rows that are 30 to 36 inches apart. Dig holes deep enough so that the roots are covered and the top of the root ball is level with the soil. After the roots are covered, gently firm the soil around each plant, then give the plants a good drink of water. Companion Plants Do's and Don'ts Brussels sprouts can be companion planted alongside beans, carrots, and celery. Beets will also benefit the soil around Brussels sprouts, adding magnesium, which is crucial for growing healthy sprouts. Aromatic herbs like dill, mint, sage, rosemary, and thyme help repel pests from the Brussels sprouts. As well, onions can enhance the flavor of Brussels sprouts as they mature. Avoid planting Brussels sprouts near any type of squash. As well, strawberries and Brussels sprouts compete for space, so they shouldn't be planted together. Finally, members of the nightshade family, like tomatoes and peppers, are heavy feeders, just like Brussels sprouts. Planting them together would not only reduce nutrients in the soil, but the unwanted competition would also stunt each plant's growth. Brussels sprouts can be grown in garden beds, raised beds, and large containers. They need about 12 to 18 inches of soil for root growth, and containers should be about 24 gallons, 90 liters, and only hold one plant each. For any of the three growing structure options, it's important that the soil is well draining, so when growing in containers, make sure those containers have holes in the bottom. Some small to medium-sized rocks can also be placed in the bottom to improve drainage. Brussels sprouts plants might also need to be staked. If they start to bend or collapse as they grow and mature, use bamboo, wooden, or metal stakes to prop them up and prevent breakage. Tie each plant to their stake using a soft material, like cotton or nylon, to prevent chafing and scarring. This last step is important since wounds can be potential entry points for bacteria and fungus. Potential pests and their solutions. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. 
For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days for about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Cabbage Looper Light to dark green caterpillars with wavy white lines on their back and sides and a distinctive arch in their back when they move. They feed on the leaves of a plant, which is also where they hide, causing ragged, large holes to appear. The damage they cause to plants is often quite severe. Here's what to do. Looper numbers are usually held in check by their natural enemies, other insects. If they do become problematic, loopers can be hand-picked from the plants. You can also apply certain safe bacteria which effectively kills the younger larvae, as well as insecticidal soaps. Just try to avoid using chemical sprays because they will also damage helpful insects. Weeds attract and shelter these pests, so it's also important to keep weed growth under control. Pests can also be prevented and controlled by using row cover slash insect netting when sowing or transplanting. As well, be sure to quickly remove any crop residue after harvest to prevent the looper from having a place to survive in over the winter. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg-laying sites and get rid of weeds which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg-laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Crickets. Crickets aren't typically a big concern, but large swarms of them can damage an entire crop. So it's always best to be cautious. Crickets feed at night and hide during the day making it hard to identify them at first. As well, crickets will feed on plants when they're very vulnerable, which is after they've just sprouted. 
here's what to do. Typically, crickets can be prevented by using drip watering instead of overhead watering. Flea beetles. Small beetles that are either black, a blue color, bronze, gray, or sometimes striped. Flea beetles jump when they're disturbed, and they also shimmer in the light. Flea beetles feed on leaves and seedlings, and the damage from their feeding habits can stunt a plant's growth, reduce yields, spread diseases, or kill seedlings off entirely. Young plants are especially vulnerable, while older plants can survive an infestation much better. Here's what to do. Use a lightweight floating row cover at the beginning of the season to prevent flea beetles from becoming an issue. There's also a homemade spray that uses two cups of rubbing alcohol, five cups of water, and one tablespoon of liquid soap that can work to repel these bugs. Test out this mixture on a single leaf first. Let it sit overnight, then spray the rest of the plant if there aren't any side effects. Dusting plants with plain talcum powder can also help, as well as using white sticky traps to capture these pests as they jump. As well, weeds attract and shelter flea beetles, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Insecticides might help for about a week, but they'll need to be reapplied, and adding a layer of mulch is yet another option. Be sure to practice crop rotation and plant seeds early to give them lots of time to establish themselves before the beetles become a problem. Mature plants are less susceptible to damage, so make sure to protect more vulnerable seedlings. Leaf Miners Leaf miners are small dark flies with triangular yellow markings that start out as yellow maggots. They feed on the leaves of a plant, creating irregular round-shaped mines slash tunnels on the leaves. These mines slash tunnels are long and narrow at first, but eventually will become an irregular shaped light colored patch. This damage can stump the growth of plants and cause the leaves of plants to turn yellow and drop. In extreme cases, severely infected seedlings can also die off completely. Here's what to do. Monitor plants for signs of these pests, paying close attention to the undersides of leaves. Typically, leaf miners can be removed using a stream of water in the early morning, and certain sprays are good to use too. Natural predators like ladybugs and parasitic wasps can also be attracted to keep leaf miners away. But if these pests are spotted on any plants, simply pick the bugs off and then carefully remove any damaged leaves. Insect netting can also be used to prevent leaf miners from attacking any plants. As well, keep in mind that soils should be plowed under immediately after harvest if any crops were infected with leaf miners. Nematodes. Also known as roundworms, nematodes are microscopic worms that live in the soil as well as inside plant tissue. They stump the growth of plants and cause galls, swelled growths, to form on a plant's roots, leaving them quite deformed. As well, leaves can become pale and twisted. Crops will eventually turn yellow from the damage and will then wilt in hot weather. A plant's yield can be affected by nematode damage, and in extreme cases, plants can die off entirely. Here's what to do. Practice crop rotation and plant-resistant varieties. As well, be sure to remove infected plants or plant residue to prevent nematodes from spreading to the next round of crops. Plant roots can be checked for galls, swelled growths, either mid-season or earlier if symptoms appear. If any galls are found, those affected plants should then be removed. Also, avoid spreading nematodes by thoroughly cleaning any garden equipment and by not moving any infected soil. Slugs and snails. These slimy pests are either hard-shelled or soft, and they are nocturnal creatures who feed on the leaves and stems of a plant during the night. 
The feeding damage from these pests leaves irregular shaped holes behind. Leaves can also be shredded or eaten entirely. And there will also be slime trails on nearby rocks, plants, and walkways. These pests thrive in damp conditions, damage a plant's growth, and also affect a plant's ability to form roots. Here's what to do. Wet conditions encourage slugs and snails. So, although it's important to keep the soil moist, it's just as important not to overwater any plants. As well, avoid overhead watering and keep any organic waste away from plants. If possible, hand pick any slugs or snails at night, which is when those pests are most active. Beer traps are another way to handle a snail or slug problem. For this, dig a hole in the ground and place a large cup or bowl into the hole. It's best to use something with steep sides so that the slugs can't crawl back out when they're done, like a mason jar. Fill the jar about half full with beer and let it sit overnight. In the morning, the jar should then be full of drowned slugs that can then be flushed down the toilet. Another option is to place a barrier of diametaceous earth, a natural powder made up of the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures around plants to keep snails and slugs away. Thrips. These are tiny, needle-thin insects that are black, brown, or light yellow in color. Thrips suck the juices of plants while also attacking the leaves and stems. Affected plants will have rough bumps, discolored speckles, or silvering on their leaves. Those leaves can then become distorted, twist, and fall off the plant. As well, thrips can spread many diseases from plant to plant. If the thrip infestation is severe enough, it can kill plants off entirely. Here's what to do. Lots of thrips can be repelled by sheets of aluminum foil that are spread between the rows of plants. Be sure to also remove weeds and debris from the garden bed after frost, and avoid planting next to onions, garlic, or cereals where large numbers of thrips can build up and then transfer onto other crops. Also, use reflective mulches early in the growing season to deter thrips. Spinosad and neem oil can also be used to spot treat heavily infested areas. Finally, release commercially available predators like minute pirate bugs, ladybugs, and lacewings, which are especially effective in greenhouses. For best results, make releases of these predator bugs after first knocking down severe thrips infestations with a spray from the garden hose. Finally, watering plants from above is another effective way to prevent a thrips infestation. Potential diseases and their solutions. Leaf spot. Circular, deep purple spots will first appear on the upper leaves. These spots then grow, and the spots' centers turn grayish to white on older leaves and light brown on young leaves. These spots will also have a defined reddish purple to rusty brown border. And as the spots grow, those spots dry out. The stems of affected plants will also wilt, and severe infections can become an entry point for other rotting diseases. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free seeds when possible. Also, avoid long leaf wetness by watering in the morning, avoiding overhead watering, and by spacing plants properly. It helps to avoid working in the garden when plants are wet, since leaf spot is mainly spread by splashing water. As well, it's important to practice crop rotation. If leaf spot is present, remove any infected plants to prevent the disease from spreading. Club root. This fungus lives in the soil and causes deformed roots and those affected roots are then unable to absorb water and nutrients for the plant. Club root can actually remain in the soil for as long as 10 to 20 years under the right conditions, and this disease is typically more common in acidic soils. Unfortunately, club root can already be well established before any symptoms are visible above the soil. Here's what to do. 
Once club root is present in the soil, it can survive for many years, up to 20. So it's hard to completely get rid of it from the soil. If club root is present, it can help to solarize the soil. To do so, simply leave a clear plastic tarp on the soil surface for four to six weeks during the hottest part of the year. That tarp will trap the heat of the sun, which will help to reduce the presence of club root. As well, plant resistant varieties when possible. Keep a clean garden and rotate crops properly. For club root, a five to seven year crop rotation is best. Carefully remove any infected plants and sterilize garden tools, one part bleach to four parts water after use. It can also work to try raising the soil's pH to a more alkaline 7.2 by mixing oyster shell or dolomite lime into the soil in the fall. Make sure soil is well draining too. Try to maintain high levels of calcium and magnesium in the soil and don't move any infested soil into healthy areas. Downy mildew. This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves. Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted, and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day, making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection, since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. Copper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. Ring spot blight. A fungal disease that causes round brown to black spots to grow on the leaves of Brussels sprouts. If the disease gets bad enough, plants will start dropping their leaves. Here's what to do. When there's evidence of ring spot, immediately remove and destroy any infected plants. A fungal disease that causes cotton-like white mold to form on infected plants. Irregular gray water-soaked lesions will appear on the leaves, while white gray lesions appear on the plant stems. Sometimes the leaves and branches will also turn slimy. During warm and humid weather, plants are often completely destroyed. This fungus can survive in the soil for more than five years, and it is spread by wind, contaminated water, and by infected seeds. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice proper crop rotation and keep planting beds well drained. Also, 
add aged compost, avoid overhead watering, and keep the garden free of debris and weeds. It also helps to avoid using excessive nitrogen fertilizer and to also keep rows spaced widely apart. If white mold is found on any plants, potassium bicarbonate is a safe, effective fungicide that kills spores on contact. Like baking soda, potassium bicarbonate is also a great preventative treatment because it raises the pH level of soil above 8.3, an alkaline environment that isn't ideal for fungus to grow. Simply mix three tablespoons of potassium bicarbonate, three tablespoons vegetable oil, and one half teaspoon of soap together into a gallon of water, then spray it onto the affected plants. Baking soda itself has a high pH of nine, so it can also help to raise the pH level of soil for plants. And the baking soda creates a very alkaline environment that kills the fungus. Typically though, baking soda is best used as a preventative treatment rather than a fungicide. Mix one tablespoon of baking soda and a half teaspoon liquid hand soap with one gallon of water. Then spray the solution on affected leaves, but don't apply it during daylight hours. It might also be best to test one or two leaves first to see if it causes sunburn to the plants. In general though, as soon as diseased plants are noticed, those plants should be destroyed immediately. If the soil is infected, try to remove as much of it as possible and then replace it with clean soil. Barriers like plastic or mulch can also be used to cover the infected ground and prevent the spread of the disease. If possible, it's also important to remove all crop residue after harvesting. This disease can survive and develop if residue is left behind. And since white mold spores are long lasting, the spores could survive the winter in this residue, if given the chance. Harvesting. Wait to harvest Brussels sprouts until after the first fall frost, as this improves their flavor. For continuous harvesting, sprouts can be harvested from the bottom of the stalk upward in the direction that they mature, as the sprouts are needed. Simply cut or snap off the leaf below the sprout, then twist off the sprout. Only harvest sprouts that are about one inch in diameter. To harvest all the sprouts of a plant at one time, cut the top growing point of the plant off when the bottom sprouts are about half an inch in diameter. Usually this is about a month before harvest, before the first fall frost. To harvest the whole plant, cut the main stem just above the soil line. As the sprout grows larger, remove the leaf just under it, channeling all the plant's energy into that sprout. The leaves are also edible and can be enjoyed either raw or cooked. Great news! The main stalk of the plant is also edible. After harvesting the plant of its sprouts and leaves, a vegetable peeler can be used to remove the outer skin. The inside stalk can then be cooked and eaten like a broccoli stem. Delicious tip! Thinly chop the stalk and bake it as chips. After the fall sprout harvest, plants can actually be left in the ground until the next season, at which point they'll flower. Then those edible flowers can also be harvested. Storing. This can't be done if the plants have been tapped. Do not wash Brussels sprouts before they get stored. Only wash them before use. Then, sprouts can simply be stored in a plastic bag in the crisper of the fridge.